And then we are now recording. Well, uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Richard and Charlie, for, for joining us and for everybody to actually to, to join the, uh, our third uh, online BCGS uh, monthly talk. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Today we're going to have two speakers for the price of one. Uh, so the first speaker is Dr. Richard Lynch, um, who is going to uh, introduce the, the topic. Uh, great speaker to, uh, to introduce us all to Michael Seismic. Uh, Richard has over 20 years experience in, uh, in mining uh, involving uh, micro seismic uh, monitoring. He was uh, CEO of a very large uh, corporation between 2011 to 2018 and now he's the Chief Operational Officer at uh, CISPRO. Uh, Richard got, uh, obtained his PhD from uh, Wits University in, in South Africa. And then our second speaker will be, uh, will be uh, Dr. Charles Beard. Uh, who's an economic geologist uh, at CISPRO as well. Um, Charlie is based out of uh, uh, Grenoble in, uh, in the Alps. Um, he, uh, he holds a PhD in experimental geology from uh, McGill University, so just in our back door in, in Canada. Uh, and uh, he, his work is, uh, is basically uh, mostly in Canada and UK, investigating uh, magmatic processes uh, for mineralization for the form formation of, of mineral deposits, uh, either for industrial use or for renewable uh, energy. And so obviously the link uh, between the, these two, uh, these two uh, fine individuals is uh, CISPRO, uh, a French uh, startup um, with, uh, with side offices in, in the USA and Australia. And obviously CISPRO is specialized in uh, micro seismic. Uh, so without further ado, I will mute myself and Richard, take it away. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to talk here today. And thank you to all, all of you for, for coming along. <clears throat> today I'm going to be talking, or Charlie and I are going to be talking about uh, ambient seismic noise um, in imaging and monitoring. So uh, I'll cover two examples, one which is uh, dam wall monitoring using fiber optic sensors, so DAS. Uh, and the other example will be mineral exploration using more conventional seismic equipment um, for a project uh, actually near, well, in Canada. Um, so before I start, uh, just to amplify a little bit about uh, CISPROBE. Uh, so it's a, a small company, as Dom said. Uh, we're based in Grenoble um, with some offices in USA and Australia, where I am. Uh, we've been operating for three and a half years now but we're already recognized as the world leader in ambient seismic noise imaging and monitoring for industrial applications. So the sorts of work we do is uh, hydrocarbon and mineral exploration, uh, hydrocarbon extraction. We do some monitoring there. Uh, geotechnicals, so near surface characterization and monitoring. Uh, and we do quite a lot of seismic hazard assessment work too. So that's uh, VS30 and VS800. Um, so as an introduction uh, to the two areas we'll talk about today, so the one is mineral exploration. So uh, as I'm sure you all know, exploration for new oil and gas and mineral deposits is, is getting more and more difficult as the near surface stuff is exhausted. Um, in this uh, uh, setting, active seismic methods are, are sometimes used uh, extensively in oil and gas, sometimes in, in minerals. Um, it's got a very long and successful history, seismic methods like that, but uh, essentially it's too expensive to apply, to apply over a very wide area early in the exploration process. So um, that, that's the one problem we are, are studying, uh, is how to use seismic methods in, in exploration earlier on in the process. Uh, the second area we look at are, is, is dam wall uh, monitoring. We've just started looking at this actually. So I'll present some results that are sort of hot off the press. Um, but clearly in this area, the motivation is that uh, monitoring of, of dam wall stability is something that uh, probably should be improved. Uh, you get two or three major failures a year, including the, the ones in Brazil that got a lot of press. Um, now the current monitoring state of the art is um, monitoring of subsurface points, so pesometers, selected points for measuring water pressure, for example. Um, Monitoring of the surface is sometimes done. So that would be either prisms or radar. 
um, and sometimes monitoring of water flows um, by means of fiber optic sensors, um, distributed temperature sensing um, in the dam wall. So our interest here is it would be very useful if we could um, use those existing buried fibers to achieve um, some monitoring of the subsurface properties. Um, so we'll, we'll look at that. Now those two problems then we're going to try and um, approach with, uh, uh, with ambient noise interferometry. So this is a, a new passive uh, seismic method that's become very popular um, in academic circles in the last decade. Um, the idea is that you, you accumulate the background vibrations that are, are ubiquitous and um, you create virtual controlled seismic sources, which you then use to study the medium. And um, this method has been used uh, in lots of different applications um, to study volcanoes, response to ruptures, earthquake prediction, fault monitoring, etc. Um, and in fact, SysProbe was formed to commercialize this method for industrial applications. So let's see how we can use ambient seismic vibrations, so noise, to, to learn something useful about the subsurface. Um, and the, the, the structure of our, our presentation today, we'll have a, a brief overview of what seismic interferometry is, how we're using it, where the noise that we are using comes from. Um, I'll mention a, a few things about uh, seismic waves because we're gonna extract, use some of those properties. Um, I'll also say a few words about uh, principles of ambient noise monitoring. And then we'll dive into our two um, case studies. So the one will be from NASDAM in Sweden. Um, that'll be the fiber optic one. And then we will talk about the mineral exploration project. That's uh, the Marathon Prospect uh, in Canada. So on interferometry, essentially it's driven by the fact that uh, if you record good noise, so let's, let's pair perfect noise for now. If you're Record good noise at, uh, at two sensors simultaneously, you can mathematically turn the one of those into a virtual source. You know, if you cross correlate those uh, signals, you essentially are extracting the greens function. Um, so exactly the details of how seismic waves propagate between the two sensors. And um, if you can get the greens function, if you can recreate it, then you can create these virtual sources at one sensor and record the signal at, at the other sensor. Um, and in doing so, you're able to then accumulate seismic energy over sometimes a very long period, sometimes a month, and uh, create these virtual sources at each sensor position and use those to then study the, the subsurface. Um, so it's cross-correlation that is driving this whole process. Now, I said perfect noise. Theoretically, we need, um, we need white noise, we need stationary noise. Um, we need an isotropic distribution of these noise sources. So they need to be all around the, the pair of sensors. They need to be not too far away. Um, there are an intrinsic scattering uh, or intrinsic attenuation issue there. So by white and stationary noise, I mean that uh, it should have a wide frequency content. Um, the time period that we're studying it, it should be reasonably constant. Um, otherwise, lots and lots of tricks are gonna have to be uh, uh, employed to compensate for that. Theoretically, we need uh, an isotropic distribution of noise sources. Um, and there do, does start to get biases that crop up um, if you don't get a, a, a perfect uh, source distribution. So look at this um, simple example. You've got two sensors here in a line, A and B. And on the same line, you've got an impulsive um, a noise source off to the left there. So let's say the impulsive noise source starts at T called naught. Um, it's recorded then at, uh, at, you know, as it passes sensor A and then later on as it passes sensor B. And if you were to do a cross correlation of the signals recorded at sensor A and sensor B, um, you'd get a cross correlation function that has a peak at the travel time um, between those two sensors. So this green spark here. If we put the noise source on the other side and uh, let it off at t equal naught, it now passes B first and then A and the cross-correlation between A and B would give a spike at negative time, which is that travel time. Uh, then the cross-correlation is now symmetric. And in this 1D example, that would be a complete Soy's distribution. You've got uh, sources on both sides. Um, in 3D, obviously you've got, uh, you need noise sources at all, in all directions, but um, 
it can be shown using stationary phase approximation that the most important noise sources are the ones that are collinear with the two sensors we are, are, are looking at. On Earth, we can't meet um, all these conditions, um, but uh, scattering certainly helps. Um, so basically, if you've got local scatterers, um, the, the noise can um, reflect off them. And even if you've got a single noise source, it essentially starts emulating a, a good noise field. So scattering is very useful in, in such an environment. Um, in theory, virtual uh, source reconstruction now requires then lots of sources around, um, white noise, we want sources not too far, not too close, and no sources in the study medium. So it's quite a lot of um, theoretical restrictions, but um, as we'll see actually, even if not all of them are met, you can still do quite a lot. So here's an example from crustal seismology, um, a magnitude uh, 2.3 earthquake. So it's a smallish earthquake recorded uh, a couple of hundred kilometers away from a seismic station. So the seismogram here looks um, quite complicated. Obviously, if the seismic uh, sensor was much closer to that earthquake, it would be a much simpler um, uh, seismogram. But here we've got all the reflections and scattering and refractions of the crust that are giving us a very complicated looking um, um, waveform that's quite rich in structure. Now, for this particular earthquake, um, it was quite lucky because there's a seismic station um, very close to the, to the source. So because it's in more or less the same place, um, when we rec do the cross correlation between the seismograms recorded at those two stations, we get, um, we get something that looks pretty similar. It's the same rich structure, also quite long in time. And in fact, comparing the two, you see that, um, wow, you get um, even reflections, refractions, et cetera, all occurring at the same time, even later on in the coda you know, 20 seconds after the source um, starts. So um, in this place, um, uh, noise is, is such that if you um, take it for the whole day and average it, or sorry, accumulate all that energy for the whole day, turn it into a virtual source, it's equivalent to about 60 kilograms of explosives. So um, that's, that's the game here. You're using very weak energy, but you're averaging over a very long time uh, and accumulating it. So the origins of the seismic uh, noise that we are looking at. Um, if you had to take a, a typical broadband crustal uh, seismic station um, in the middle of a, a continent, for example, this one from continental uh, 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 North America, you would see basically um, at low periods, so this is high frequencies, um, you get power which is generated from human activities. Um, and then later on, um, you get a very distinctive feature, which is caused by the ocean land interaction. Um, and this is the, called the, the primary and the secondary mechanism um, for these microseisms. And uh, they occur at seven seconds and 14 seconds. The, the primary um, uh, mechanism, which actually produces the weaker waves, um, occurs where waves um, approach the shore and at distances um, or at, at depths where the wavelength is comparable to the depth, you get um, transmission of energy into the, the seabed and um, this energy then flows through the crust. Um, and so waves are, are always moving, powered by the moon, and, um, and so you get a lot of energy penetrating into the crust from, from this primary method. Um, and that is at 14 seconds, typically, period. Now, um, the mechanism of the secondary um, microseismic peak uh, at seven seconds, it is from a standing wave that gets set up. Whenever you get uh, waves of similar, um, similar wavelength that are traveling forwards and backwards, uh, you get standing waves set up. And these standing waves, um, importantly now, the pressure is propagated all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. And so, it's not just very close to the shore, but even quite deeper in the ocean that uh, this effect takes place. And this produces the, the majority of, of the energy being transmitted from the ocean to the, to the land. At, um, at higher frequencies, um, we get a, a lot of cultural noise. So this is from a variety of sources, uh, car traffic, uh, uh, harmonic engines. So this would be industrial uh, machines, etc human steps, uh, train noise, all of the human activities. 
And uh, in this spectrogram here, we can see there's even a strong, at high frequencies, there's even a strong um, um, a diurnal variation, basically, uh, well, as well as a, a weekend effect. So here we're seeing the that strongly on weekends, um, industrial activity drops off and, uh, and we can see that effect. Um, now I'll just mention a few words about uh, surface waves. So surface waves in an earthquake are, are the strongest, um, uh, highest, you know, strongest level of shaking that lasts the longest. It causes most of the damage, the, the surface waves. And the reason for this is that these waves attenuate, they're, they're confined to the surface of the earth and, um, and so they attenuate very slowly. And so in an earthquake um, from the other side of the world, you would see relatively small um, uh, direct waves, the P wave, S wave, um, the reflections off the, the core, etc. But then you get very strong and sustained surface waves that arrive sometimes later. Um, that cause, like I say, most of the damage. These surface waves, there's two kinds. There's the Rayleigh wave and there's the Love wave. Um, and the Rayleigh wave is a, uh, an elliptical wave that is visible on the vertical and the radial components of a seismogram, of a 3D seismogram. Um, and the, the love waves then are, are, um, are transverse um, um, uh, waves, um, and they're basically found on the transverse component. So these little animations here show there's the elliptical up-down motion of the Rayleigh waves uh, and the love waves. And you can see for both waves, they're surface waves, which means they, their amplitude decays with depth. They're mainly confined to the surface. Um, they're evanescent. Um, but this also means that the lower frequencies penetrate deeper into the crust, um, which is a very interesting effect. So the, the, low, uh, the, the high frequency um, waves, the low wavelength, they um, sample the, uh, the earth very close to the surface. So for example, they would be traveling in sand layers, or very weathered layers, et cetera. So typically they travel quite slowly. The deeper waves, so the longer wavelength um, stuff, uh, the low periods, uh, low frequency stuff, that uh, travels, uh, it's what samples much uh, uh, more rock. And typically the deeper stuff is traveling, uh, it's got a higher velocity, higher seismic velocity. So these waves travel a little bit faster. And, um, this effect, uh, this dispersion effect, um, is what we take advantage of um, when we do exploration work with surface waves. So just a, a few words on mount monitoring. Um, oops, a few words on monitoring now is, um, so we've uh, seen that uh, the noise correlation um, gives us the impulse response of the ground between two sensors. Um, you know, we cross correlate these two sensors with good noise fields and we would get something that looks like this. Um, it's symmetric. So uh, this part would be the Green's function from sensor B to sensor A. And this part is from sensor A to sensor B. But the important point is that you can repeat this cross correlation as long as you've got stable noise. Um, you get a very similar looking cross correlation function in time. And so every time period, every day, every minute, whatever, you can um, repeat this process and then start looking at differences in the cross-correlation functions, um, cross-correlation of cross-correlations actually, um, to start uh, telling differences about the subsurface. So that's, that's the sort of the basis of, of monitoring. Um, you can use different parts of the cross-correlation. So you can confine your activity to the, the ballistic, the direct uh, waves, um, or look later on in the coda um, and use parts of those. So the coda waves are more sensitive. Uh, I'll show you in a second. Um, but the direct waves, you can localize the changes. You can start figuring out where those um, velocity changes are taking place uh, more easily with the, the ballistic waves. And um, well, actually, let me go back a second there. No. Yeah. So the the coda waves um, are, are quite, as I said, quite sensitive. Oops. The coda waves, as I said, are quite sensitive. And um, so they can be used to detect um, velocity changes even down to as low as one part in a million. So incredibly small velocity changes. So these velocity changes are actually caused by, for example, the tidal effects um, uh, or caused by uh, temperature changes on surface. 
Um, whereas the direct, the ballistic waves um, are used more for detecting, you know, down to maybe 1% or 0.1% um, changes. So for the, the direct waves, the ballistic waves, um, you could use either um, surface waves, which like I said, were confined to the surface, or for some targets, like for example, fault monitoring, you would probably prefer to use a body wave. And so as long as you've got enough energy you can recover, um, body waves would be preferable in that environment. Now, the cross correlations over time are often plotted like this uh, plot down here where you would see a single cross correlation, the black uh, curve. Um, what you do is you color it, um, in this case, uh, red is maximum positive and blue is maximum negative. And then you, you plot each one of those cross correlations over time. And you can see here, these banded structures are showing us that um, the cross correlation function is indeed quite stable over time. And this is, this is a 20 day period here. Um, occasionally it drops out, the noise changes or, or we lose data or something. But um, for the most part, it's, it's quite stable. And so we can use that uh, quite successfully for monitoring. Um, for coda wave interferometry, as, as I said, the, um, because you're looking later on in the coda, the waves have bounced around and scattered quite a lot in the medium to get uh, between the two sensors. And so because they've sampled the medium for so long, they are much more sensitive to changes in the medium. You know, if you've got, uh, for example, air pressure changing on surface, a kilometer down, you're getting little micro fractures that are closed up and uh, the velocity is you know, increased or decreased in a, a very small way, but measurable using this method. Um, so a good example of this in a crustal scale is from my, my colleague, uh, Florent Bregawa on the Toku, Toku the, the Japan earthquake we had in uh, 2011. Um, and here we see basically coda wave interferometry between stations has been used to get the velocity changes in the crust. This is before the, the big earthquake in Tokohoku. And um, here we see basically the, the, the effects of the crust after the shaking. So this is many days after the, the earthquake, but the dynamic waves have shaken the crust and um, caused velocity uh, drop well under 1%, but measurable. And this takes uh, quite a long time to heal, actually. So you can do games like this with, um, with coda wave interferometry. Right, so now let's talk about uh, dam wall monitoring um, on this uh, NAS dam. So this is um, some work done in, in collaboration with our partners, Selexa. Um, they're a fiber optic company, so they're experts at getting um, uh, DAS as well as DTS data out of fibers. Um, so this place, NAS Dam, is one of Sweden's oldest um, hydroelectric dams. In fact, it was once 50% of Sweden's electricity generation. And um, a new dam has been built um, and fiber, fiber optic cables installed um, in the dam wall on top of the core. So these fibers are, are used for distributed uh, temperature sensing to detect leaks. Um, but fiber, fibers can also uh, yield seismic data um, using the fiber as a distributed sensor. So here we've got a fiber um, installed as a loop on uh, the older part of the dam and the newer part of the dam wall. Um, this is uh, 40 days of data recorded in, in late 2019 that we're going to be using. We effectively get a, a sensor every one meter um, and uh, with data sampled at a kilohertz. So now the question is basically like, uh, you know, is that data noise, et cetera, good enough uh, with cultural noise around this dam to, to do some work in it? So what we did is we took um, a subset of the data. Um, we took a sensor every five meters. Um, we downsampled the data um, to 100 hertz after we looked at the frequency content. And we focused our attention mainly in this newest part of the dam. So looking at the raw data, we see there's, there's lots of um, energy above um, eight hertz uh, in this orange band here. And um, over time, it is quite constant. So that's, that's you know, the first indication that, uh -huh, that, that look, the noise quality looks, looks pretty good um, in this place. Um, if we look at a, so we, we downsample into 100 hertz and, um, and we see that um, between about five and 25 hertz is, is very good, useful data. There's lots of noise there. 
So our analysis is focused on that band there. It's relatively high frequency compared to the, the sort of band we use for mineral exploration. That's because we are interested in much smaller structures here closer to the surface. So this is what um, some cross correlations um, look like. So this is a virtual sensor at the uh, south side of the fiber. Um, you can see definitely there's some um, consistent arrivals. The cross correlation function is not symmetric. So that tells us that the noise is not uh, isotropic. It's coming in different directions here. But um, in this one here, this is the virtual source at the top of the, the, the dam wall. And we see a, a pretty consistent, strong arrival um, taking place. Now this, these uh, cross correlations are without any frequency filter. And, um, and obviously in this distance um, time approach, um, if we get a, a linear, well, a constant velocity um, would, be, would occur at, at times like, for example, this red line here, that would be a constant velocity. So in this um, frequency band here, the five to 20 Hertz band, um, we enhance um, some of the arrivals. Uh, and in fact, so this one here even has dispersion. So we, we're sure it's a surface wave. Um, and the main energy is coming from the north in this um, band. At a higher frequency band, um, we are seeing the body wave um, with actually most of the energy at this band coming from the south. So we can see fairly good uh, body wave arrivals here. Uh, and yeah. So over time, um, this is now the cross correlation function. This is the average one over the whole 40 day period. And you can see comparison to all of the individual cross correlation functions. Um, and you can see it's, it's pretty stable in time, even quite later on in the coda. Um, I mean, that's quite a stable um, uh, cross correlation. So that's very good news. We can probably use it for monitoring. Um, so to do some imaging work, um, so now what we do is we look at um, a, a virtual source at the one side of the fiber, and we see how the body wave propagates along the fiber. And um, because we know where each one of the sensors is on the fiber, we can um, get a time difference in the arrivals um, of the wave at each sensor and convert that to a velocity at that place. Um, and so here is the process. We use cross correlation on the cross correlated curves to get the, the small time differences between neighboring pairs. And we use the time differences then to um, compute the velocity um, at each uh, point. And here we see that uh, mainly in the, well, the, um, the south side of the dam, we've got a slightly, sorry, the south side, the bottom one there, we've got a slightly um, higher um, velocity and um, with the northern part, it's a slightly slower velocity um, by a little bit. So that's sort of the first kind of result is that you can actually get cross correlations of sufficient quality to get consistent velocity estimates for different parts of the dam wall now. This is using a surface wave. So the, the previous work was a body wave that would probably be traveling more in the core of the dam. Um, surface wave, um, uh, at, at these frequencies would, um, would penetrate the core too, but um, uh, also be confined on the, the surface there. And so use the same trick basically here um, with changes between neighboring um, sensors, uh, getting us the velocity. And here we get a periodicity in, in, uh, in, in space, so along the fiber. And um, we're finding actually, again, the, the um, faster velocities in the south but there is some, some zones where there's a bit of a dip, you know, a drop in velocity, uh, and this is pretty periodic. It's also pretty suggestive given the satellite imagery showing um, uh, uh, ladders set into the dam walls at those places. Um, and so it's possible that it's related to that. Now we can use um, these sorts of waves. Uh, we do the cross correlation every 15 minutes and we can use these 15 minute slices now to perform monitoring. So um, we compute a reference, which is the average cross correlation over the whole 40 day period. Um, and then we compete a, a cross correlation section every 15 minutes and compare that to the reference. Now, if there was a homogeneous change in the wall um, within the dam, then it would induce a linear time shift along the fiber. And 
So then we would get a relative velocity change of the whole dam wall proportional just to the slope of the linear regression um, over, over distance. And here's what we get. So we see that basically we've got uh, velocities that are sort of fairly constant. Maybe the error in this velocity you can probably estimate at, I don't know, 0.3%, something like that. Maybe half a percent. Um, and then sort of in beginning of October, it drops a bit um, and stabilizes again late October um, with maybe a couple of percent change over, over that 40-day uh, period. Now, a few percent change is not, uh, is not very much. This is a perfectly stable dam. Um, but still, there are environmental factors, temperature changes, precipitation, uh, dam level, etc. That's that's taking place in this time period. Um, we can also use coda wave interferometry uh, as a method here. So here, later on in the coda, we can see it's quite stable uh, over the 40-day period. And um, we do the same trick. We, every 15 minutes, compare against the reference to see what the relative velocity changes. Um, so here at this, this part of the dam wall, we're getting, um, again, this few percent uh, variation over time. Uh, further up the dam wall, we get less of a, a decrease over time, uh, a bit more scatter maybe. Um, and uh, on the, past the abutment, basically on land, we're getting um, not much change, uh, maybe 1% over that period. So there's a stronger change um, at the south part of this dam wall. Uh, looking at all of the, the uh, fiber pairs um, as we go along it, we see for all of them that um, basically uh, they're one velocity up to about the end of September, and then they do all start dropping off before stabilizing at the late uh, part of October. So it's a sort of consistent pattern over all of the fibers. Um, now, a few comments then about the imaging is that, um, so we can use surface waves to, to image the local structures of the dam to see what part of the dam is faster, what part's slower. Um, you know, is that what we expect given the construction of the dam wall? Um, we can use different uh, kinds of waves. We can use maybe body waves, surface waves, depending if we understand their nature, where they're propagating. So in this context, then numerical modeling is quite useful. You know, building a model of the dam wall um, setting off a virtual source in one place, seeing when we expect the body waves and the surface waves to arrive at the other sensors. Uh, as far as the monitoring goes, so we've seen that we can use coda waves as well as surface waves to monitor relative velocity changes in the dam wall. Um, our spatial resolution is constrained by the kind of wave and the method we're using, but uh, those results there were sort of roughly 50 meters or so uh, resolution, not, not very high resolution. Um, of course, if we use all the fiber data, we only used a very small subset here, um, we could enhance the results. Um, and like I say, a, a comparison with physical properties of, of uh, what's going on there is interesting. You know, whether temperature is having an effect on the dam wall, precipitation, etc. So second um, little uh, case study I'd like to, to go through is um, a marathon mine. And um, here, basically, it's a project in um, near Lake Superior that my colleague will talk about. Uh, we're using uh, nodes in this environment um, to we're using nodes in this environment um, to um, collect our data. So these are autonomous seismic nodes that have got about a, a month or so of battery life. Uh, they come in three component or, or one component uh, versions. So there were one component, the vertical component used in this study. Um, they take a few minutes to, to deploy. They're pretty cheap, uh, no cables, very low environmental foot, footprint. You can walk them into an area, even a mountainous area, and, um, and install them and then come back and collect them later on. We normally record for about a month. So this study was for 35 days. So in that period, um, we do get uh, a good noise, um, even down to quite low, um, uh, quite low frequencies, quite high periods. Um, we can see that we are recovering successfully down to about uh, 10 seconds here, uh, even with these uh, high frequency geophones, because we're recording for such a long period um, or long, long interval. The spectrogram here also shows that um, we're getting bursts of low frequency um, uh, waves um, from storm waves in the sea. 
And um, at the high end of the frequency spectrum, um, we're getting diurnal activities from these human activities. So we've got uh, you know, high frequency and low frequency noise. Because we've got a, a nice um, 2D array, we can do beam forming. And um, here we see that the high frequency um, waves are coming from um, waves in Lake Superior uh, and also human activities uh, on the coastline there. And um, the very low frequencies is coming from maybe mainly the North Atlantic uh, Ocean, so storms in the North Atlantic. This is um, a cross correlation um, with a virtual sensor created at the end here. And um, you can see a very clear propagation across the array. Um, we're seeing that the lower frequencies arrive first, the higher frequencies arrive uh, later on. So this is um, a clear dispersion here. And, um, but propagating over the length of the whole array, which is about six kilometers. At the different frequency bands, uh, the low frequency, intermediate and high, um, we're seeing at low frequency, we get clear propagation over the whole array at six, uh, six kilometers. But the high frequencies, it does get a little bit uh, shaky towards the end, but certainly strong propagation, clear propagation over four kilometers, which is fine for our purposes. So here we are um, picking the dispersion curves. Uh, we can either pick uh, or measure the, the phase um, uh, velocities at each frequency uh, using an Iconol approach, or we can uh, pick the dispersion curve of the group velocities um, using the, the FTAN algorithm. So it's a combination of um, uh, uh, manual and uh, automatic processing uh, to pick out these dispersion curves. But uh, for every uh, ray joining every single sensor pair, at every frequency, we have now measured the, the velocities. And so we can use all of this information to compute um, the velocity maps. So this would be for both the, the phase and the group velocities. So for every period, we've got a map of how velocity is um, in this area. So now basically at every point um, in the array, we have for every frequency, what is the seismic velocity? Um, for both the, the uh, group and the phase velocity approach. So now we're able to use all that information together to invert for a velocity model, subsurface velocity model. It's a 1D model at that particular place. Um, and we construct that 1D, or we, we, we invert for the 1D model. And then we take um, uh, at every, the 1D models that we invert at every single position and we glue it all together to get a properly 3D um, velocity model, um, S-wave velocity model um, in this area. And here there are uh, uh, fits. Um, so this is the model basically that was fitting the data here. So the data is shown as the error bars um, and the model fits basically um, are shown um, in color and with the reds basically showing where the, the more velocity models, um, trial velocity models are found. So you can see the fits to the data in their various areas. And the output of that is a, an S-wave uh, velocity cube. Um, we can take slices of various depths and we can now interpret it um, um, and compare it to the geology, which is what my uh, colleague um, will now uh, take over. So Charlie, over to you. Okay, hello everybody. Um, let's just make sure this is working nicely. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Good. Yeah, it's great, Charles. Okay. Ready to go. Super, good stuff. Okay, so my background is quite different from most people at CISPROBE. I'm an economic geologist um, and I've got background in mostly geochemistry. Um, and so I've been brought in to ask all the difficult questions and hopefully streamline some of the processes which we use in CISPROBE. Um, to, to compare with the geology and also to fit these seismic models um, so that they're reasonable in terms of structures and that sort of thing. So um, I'm a postdoc on the Pacific project, which is um, an EU Horizon 2020 project. And the main uh, partners in it are CISPRO, University of Grenoble Alps, and the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies. 
Um, today I'm going to be talking mostly about a case study uh, with generation mining at the Marathon Palladium Copper Deposit in Ontario. So just to locate you here, um, the Marathon Deposit is on the north shore of Lake Superior um, and there's quite a lot of other mining in that area. Um, it's associated with the Mid-Continent Rift, which is around 1.1 GA. Um, and the field fault here has focused um, low degree melts up from um, the subcontinental lithospheric mantle and emplaced them as this cold well alkaline product at complex here on the north coast. Um, so we're going to zoom in a little bit there. Um, it's quite early in the, um, in the emplacement of this province. Um, and what we're interested in here is this, um, this gabbroic unit, which is defining the outer edge of the complex here. So um, there's a lot of sort of caldera-like sort of structures here. We've got uh, some trapdoors. We've got some sort of uh, fractures through the center here, which are associated with the lid potentially breaking. Um, and we can define some of those down in the, in the deposit scale in terms of uh, drilling data. So um, this little bar here on the right is uh, the age of the units approximately that we're interested in for the mineralization relative to the rest of the deposit here. Okay, so this is just a few pictures of some rocks and some cross sections from uh, the company, from Generation Mining. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly walk you through the geology here and then we'll talk about what we can and cannot see in the seismic images. So number one here, this is the football. Um, so it's brecciated in some places and it's largely Archean volcanic rocks or Archean granitoids. Um, and that's shown here in this image. Um, then what we have is we have a layered and fine grained gabbro intruded. So that's this two and this three. So this is the fine grained gabbro here. And this is the layered gabbro here, and they're quite fast. Um, then we've got the mineralized uh, unit here, which is the two duct lake gabbro, which is just above this football unit here. Um, and that one can, uh, can be a little bit more aphytic like this, um, but the velocities are not that distinctive from the two and the three in the brown and the blue. Um, and then finishing off, we have this, this pink unit here, which is a cyanite and that one is slower. So uh, what we've got, we've got all of this uh, in three dimensions in a leapfrog model, uh, which really allows us to compare in a very nice, um, easy to use sort of way, um, the seismic models and other geophysical models, as well as the drilling data. And so what I'm showing here is uh, in the green, we've got that football breach here, which I showed in that previous diagram. And then we've got uh, the two duct lake gabbro, which hosts the marathon deposit in purple here. Um, you can see that most of those drill holes there, uh, which are shown mostly towards the right of this image, um, are bottoming out around 400 meters below surface. And the passive seismic technique is handy because it allows us to, to quite effectively go quite a lot deeper than that to two to three kilometers in typical cases. So the aim of this study is to use the passive seismic survey to determine the intrusion geometry at depth and hopefully locate structures that guided the mineralization. So um, unfortunately, in the case of uh, many mineral deposits, the commodity we're interested in is at very small concentrations. So in, in this case, we're looking at hundreds of ppm potentially. And so that's not going to change the seismic properties itself. So we're going to look at the host rocks uh, for that and hopefully fingerprint those. Um, so Richard's briefly been through the deployment. So it's uh, just over a thousand nodes, which we're collecting data for 35 days. Uh, you may be able to see these little green spots here. That's where all the node positions are. And you can see that relative to the cyanite, the football breach here and the marathon deposit here. Just because that image isn't very clear, I've shown uh, this here. And so we've got that river, which you can see on both of these two images here on the right hand side. So the main survey here uh, has a nominal spacing of around 150 meters between sensors um, and this will be used uh, typically just for the deeper parts of the deposit and we've also got a fat line which has much much tighter uh, spacing of 50 meters 
um, through this, this cross section here, um, which will be used uh, for the deep parts, but as well we can potentially access some higher frequency noise and look at the shallower parts of the deposit using this data. Um, so again, here are the two main noise sources. So from the southwest, we have some high frequency noise from the uh, Trans-Canadian Railway, uh, which is freight trains, and uh, there's some work going on at the University of Grenoble Alps to characterize the noise sources from that railway. Um, there's also potentially some noise from Lake Superior from waves lapping up against the coast. Um, and then those beam forming diagrams Richard showed, uh, we can also see that we have low frequency noise associated with storms coming from the Atlantic Ocean in the northeast. So, Seismic fingerprints, can we identify uh, units in the subsurface based on their velocity? So um, a few samples have been uh, gathered in the field um, by John McBride, who is one of the geologists at Generation. And they've been measured at Western University in Ontario um, for velocities, uh, usually just P wave, but some have been measured for S wave as well, and bulk density as well. And what we can see in this very uh, brief diagram here is that unfortunately the Coldwell Gabbros um, that are mineralized, which is shown with these purple labels here on the right hand side, overlap within ERA in terms of their density and P wave velocity with all of the other Gabroic rocks here. So this would be the ones which were blue and brown in that first cross section I showed versus the ones that are purple. Fortunately though, what we can see here is that the football breccia, so that's the Archean volcanic rocks that predate the complex and the granitoids, um, have lower P-wave velocities and lower bulk densities. So we can effectively fingerprint those. Um, also the cyanite, that youngest unit, which is uh, defining the center of the complex and is quite volumetrically um, important, has a lower density and a slightly lower velocity. So we may be able to see that as well. Um, one thing which we found a bit difficult though is to quantify the effect of confining pressure on seismic velocities. So in many cases what we see is that the velocity tends to increase with depth and we don't know all of the factors which, um, which uh, contribute to this. So in sedimentary basins this is fairly well understood in terms of compaction of sediments as confining pressure increases and closure of fractures. Um, and in these rocks, because the petrophysical measurements were made on hand samples, we don't really uh, capture those effects of macro, macro structures and closure of fault systems. So in an ideal world, what we would do is we would have petrophysical measurements made on core and also downhole measurements, and we would be able to compare those directly to one another. So we have a few case studies other than this one here where we, uh, we have that sort of data set and we're in investigating that right now to, to quantify those effects. Um, so what we can do is we can use um, these 3D uh, S-wave velocity models, which Richard briefly talked about, to uh, interpret what's happening with the geology below that 400 meter depth where most of the drilling is limited. So, what we can see here on the right here, we've got the green Archean volcanics dipping down towards the southwest. Um, and then overlying that, we have the Eastern Gabbro. Um, this red uh, color map here is um, a velocity anomaly map. So this is um, relative to the average velocity for that depth. So correcting for this, this um, pressure related effect, which we're seeing. Um, and in the top here on the right, we've got the marathon deposit in purple. So the wireframes for this are only defined based on the drilling um, because we cannot uh, specifically fingerprint that relative to the rest of the Gabroke rocks. Um, the cyanite on the left here, we've used the uh, ISO velocity shell um, associated with uh, where that intersects with drilling data for the cyanite Gabro contact, and we've used that to help define. The shape of that contact. Additionally, where the Archean volcanics uh, start dipping down towards the southwest, away from the limits of drilling, we've helped um, the interpretation there by using that ISO velocity surface in the S wave velocity model. Um, quite an interesting finding here is that we have these high velocity phases at depth, which have a similar velocity 
to the Eastern Gabbro. Um, so we may be able to find some things uh, out with these deeper models here about the interconnectivity of the magmatic plumbing system and also potentially other places where PGE and copper might be concentrated. So as I've briefly said here, uh, research in progress, we're optimizing uh, some of the seismic model fitting procedures, uh, especially for structurally complex applications. So one thing Richard briefly uh, mentioned here was uh, that we fit 1D velocity profiles over um, a 2D grid from plan view downwards. Um, and a lot of the time here, we use some a priori information to predict what the velocity structure will be and reduce the amount of computational time required for fitting the models. Um, so many of the times, these models in hist historical contexts have been used in the oil and gas industry, where we're in basins and everything is fairly flat lying. However, if we look at this case study with Marathon, we can see a quite strongly dipping layer uh, down to the southwest, which is quite difficult to model with a 1D profile if you use the same profile over the entirety of the model. So we're developing um, fitting procedures which will predict, predict a range of velocities um, and use several different positions on the model uh, to, to define those so that we can search a smaller parameter space and ideally um, generate models which have a lower misfit and lower uncertainty um, and are more geologically reasonable. Another thing which we're exploring as part of Pacific is using principal component analysis or trained uh, machine learning techniques that will integrate multiple different geophysical data types. So that might also involve gravity or magnetotelerics, and this might help us with fingerprinting lithologies. What we might be able to do here is define a fingerprint for a lithology where it's well uh, constrained by drilling, and then use that to help constrain things at greater depths where we don't have that luxury. Um, so a brief summary on the imaging. So the seismic nodes can be deployed in environmentally sensitive areas. They're lightweight, probably about three, five kilograms each. Uh, so they can easily be carried in backpacks. Um, it's very inexpensive compared with an active seismic, um, especially if you start involving explosions or virus size trucks. Um, and the seismic velocity models uh, can aid exploration campaigns uh, typically at the prospect deposit scale, so that's about 20 to 4 kilometers lateral, and we're talking 1 to maybe 3 kilometers in depth. So with that, uh, thank you very much, and um, we'll take some questions if that's okay. Wonderful. Thank you both. Thank you, uh, Richard and, and Charlie. This is, a, this is a model talk where we have both a great background theory and, uh, and, and applied uh, examples, so excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, as um, Charlie just mentioned, uh, if anyone wants to would like to uh, ask a question, feel free to uh, turn your microphone back on and, and your video. Uh, we unfortunately still haven't figured out the uh, the raising hand option here. It's a, it's on me. Well, next time we'll have it. But uh, just for now, uh, first come, first serve. If if anyone wants to ask a question, go ahead. Yeah. I got a question, or oh, maybe I'm uh, budging in on someone there. It's kind of hard. To, uh, this is Jan Detmer from University of Calgary. Um, I, I had a question for uh, Richard, I think, um, regarding on, on slide 50. I found it really interesting where you're showing the, the variability of the velocity along the dam. Um, I was really surprised to see that high a variability um, for the kind of wavelengths. I, I didn't quite catch what periods you're looking at. Um, but, but it seemed, you know, like of the order of 400 meters per second or so over very short distances. Um, can you comment on that in, in particular with regard to what you think the uncertainty is on these estimates? Uh, sure. So uh, I wonder if I can share my screen again. Um, oops. No, hold on. Sorry, give me five seconds here. I'll try and share my screen again. Um, so that that slide, right? Oh, we, I can't uh, see it. We don't have it yet, no, Richard. We're not seeing your screen share, Richard. We're not seeing my screen share. Mm, why not? Uh, you might have to click on the uh, 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 which uh, window. Right, there right, we go. Right, there sorry, go. sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we've got that now.
<laughs> all these technological impediments. Okay, so now, can you see my screen now? That's right, that's exactly the slide I meant, yeah. Okay, uh, fantastic. Thank you. All right, so, so sorry, your question was, um, you're surprised on the variability um, that we see. Yeah, um, there seems to be a really large amount of variability sort of dot to dot. Um, so I, I wondered if you have looked at uncertainty um, and, and or, or if oh, you could right. comment in any other way, what would be responsible for these large variations? Well, so to be honest, I haven't, um, I haven't classified or I haven't included slides here on, on the, the error estimates. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure what those are, but um, you know, in conversations with the dam engineer, um, so while the dam itself is a fairly homogeneous structure, um, you know, and that's a, it's a core with some uh, broken material over on top. Um, it is possible that at the top part, basically, um, it was slightly, uh, well, the core would have been different and it would have been slightly thinner. So um, he wasn't surprised that basically there was a slight uh, velocity variation here. And I mean, 100 meters a second is not, is not massive. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, I I also wondered about what's the uh, um, what's the depth averaging here. You think um, so? Um, the velocity estimate is, of course, it's not purely superficial, but f uh, over what kind of depth range do you think you're averaging uh, of, here? Of course, of course. So, um, well, the basically the the band that we're looking at, I think, for this particular study was looking at something like fifteen hertz. Okay. Um, and so fifteen hertz. That's some tens of uh, meters wavelength here. Um, you know, so maybe even 50 meters or something. So it would be, it would be touching definitely on the basement um, too. Um, right. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's really interesting. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Who's next? So Charlie, it's Brendan here from Tech Resources. Um, and this might be, I might have missed something in one of your slides. So this could be all on me. Um, you, in the marathon example, you showed the, the the cross plot the petrophysical cross plot of the gabbro and the cyanite samples, but with p wave velocity measured, and then you know you went and showed the final results. And I assume they were s wave isosurfaces in leaf frog. So how can you comment on on how you you link the p wave and the s wave in that setting? So. Um well, I'm not, I'm not really a seismologist yet, I'm afraid. So I can I can answer this a little bit, but maybe Richard might want to jump in if I'm not uh, stating this in a, a totally correct way. Um, so the P wave and the S wave velocity are often um, positively correlated, uh, but it's not perfectly one to one all the time. Um, but typically, when we're measuring these ambient noise seismic tomography models. Um, we do have to make some assumptions about either density or the VPVS ratio while we're fitting these models. So in some cases, if we have, um, say, a massive sulfide where we know what the mineralogy is, we can define a mixing line between a silicate rock, which we might have there, and that sulfide. And then we can quite um, effectively um, characterize those VPVS ratios and how those vary. Um, whereas if we're typically in lots of silicate rocks like this, the range of VPVS, I, I think it's quite narrow. Um, so yeah, so I think this is, this is something which we, we do. Um, with these petrophysical measurements on the hand samples, um, many of them have only been measured for P wave velocity and not for S wave velocity. So we sometimes have to use that um, that slightly imperfect way of, of comparing the data. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Perfect. So we were just uh, we just passed the hour. There's nothing nothing uh, preventing us from continuing discussing here. Um, I will just uh, uh, it's a good time to probably end the recording for to have a, a good YouTube session. So again. Uh, Thank you, uh, Richard and Charlie, for, for joining us. And then uh, uh, next month, we, we're going to have another uh, BCGS uh, Monthly Talk. So please uh, stay tuned for the newsletter. I will Thank stop the recording much. now. <laughs>